Hi everyone! Welcome to the annual Reason Roundtable Webathon video bonus episode. I'm Matt. That's Nick. That's Kat. Oh God! Don't touch Nick. Um, this is going to be fine. We've spent a lot of time in each other's company over the, <laughs> during the pandemic. We have absolutely forgotten how to behave. Hi, how is everybody doing? Hi, Matt. We're Hi, Matt. To be here. Happy webathon. Yeah, that's enough moderation. Um, <laughs> what we're going to do here is uh, you sent a bunch of questions and we're going to answer them. Um, in years past, we've given soliloquies about uh, how much reason has meant to all of us individually, uh, careerly, and in the world. It might come up again. We're going to try to get through as many questions as possible. In the meantime, some to the gang, some to those of us individually. Let's start with Brandon. Let's go to Brandon. Oh, wow. really? I just, yeah. Okay. Fuck you, Matt. <laughs> strong, <laughs> strong start. <laughs> Brandon writes, can you make a case, and we'll direct this at Catherine to begin with, can you make a case for why libertarians should intellectually engage with mainstream journalism? Certain types of libertarians seem to have a tendency to immediately dismiss any source because of real or imagined biases that are connected to a publisher that is considered mainstream, like the Atlantic, New York Times, or Washington Post. Again, all the places where Peter Suderman's wife is working. Uh, Reason, on the other hand, seems to more deeply interact Back with check. with content from such sources in ways beyond simply mocking them when they get things wrong. What value do you find there is in doing so for a libertarian audience? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think right. the answer is is kind of obvious, which is that if we want to have more libertarians, then we should talk to and about people and publications that aren't only libertarian, that don't already agree with us. I think dismissing a publication because it has bias is the wrong approach. And I say that not least because I edit a publication that has bias. Like we we just happen to put our bias on the tin. We sort of say it up front. Hey, here's what we're doing. Here's why, why we're doing it on the tin. That's what they say. It's okay. what it says on the tin, on the label. I'll translate it to American for you. Thank you. Um, and, um, you know, I wish that the Atlantic and the Washington Post and others were maybe a little more upfront about their biases, but I think that 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 is not a reason to engage with the legitimate factual claims that people make, with the analytical uh, problems that they posit. And and yeah, we want to be part of, I think Nick Gillespie can agree, we want to be part of a conversation. We want to get a conversation yep. going. Actually, want to dominate the conversation. And some Guide of us the do. conversation. Yes. You the know, the well, brontosaurus approach doesn't work for... The friendly brontosaurus is not is not um, a journalistic okay. tool. I do think there are, generally speaking, two types of, uh, in almost any subculture, but a, certainly a libertarian one, of people who want to kind of take over the world in a, in a positive way. Of course, that means, you know, we take over the world and leave them alone. But you want to influence the mainstream culture and you want to kind of integrate into it so that they become more interested in and uh, reflective of libertarian beliefs. There's another subset which almost sees, and you know, this this comes up a lot in like indie music scenes, where it's like when you know when when U2 or REM went from smaller labels to big bad Warner Brothers or national labels, they sold out. Right. It's like no, you know, this is about society and it's about changing things. And like, you can you can be a small band of you know perfectly pure, perfectly clean, usually kind of uninteresting and insane people because you only talk to people who agree with you or egg you on to more and more extreme points of view, or you can be more open-ended and actually live your life and try and persuade people who don't agree with you, this is a better direction to go in. So I, that's the argument for engaging always with the, with the mainstream to change it and maybe also to break it up into smaller and smaller things so there's less of a mainstream, which is one of the great triumphs, I would argue, of libertarian thought over the past 40 years. Though I will say professionally, I think like I deeply believe in this engagement strategy and the kind of like if anyone wants to join us in any part of the of the coalition, that's great. Personally, I have 100 percent stopped trying to convince the people in my life of anything. Sure. Like I'm just tired. This is a, we're going including straight to the co-workers. therapy session. We're going straight to the therapy <laughs> session. Including co-workers. That's what this special yeah. webathon episode is about, right? Um. I would point out, so in 2008 was when we first started the Webathon, um, and I think we've already exceeded our 2008 numbers, so thank you very much for donating to this 501c3. Um, but we also, that was the 40th anniversary uh, issue. I was newly uh, editor, having uh, been given the baton by Nick Gillespie. Uh, and we did a oral history of Reason Magazine pursuant to this, because it's an early point when uh, Bob Poole, Manny Klausner, and Tibor McCann took over 
management of the magazine from uh, T uh, Lanny. Uh, from Lanny Fle Freelander should should remember that name. Um, they uh, were covering. They had a little. Uh, internal newsletter that covered the libertarian party which is another question that comes up always in these things um and all the infighting we'd be surprised to know that the libertarian party was was infighting even back in the early 70s um and uh it created a lot of sort of tension and they had a decision to make uh should we be the kind of you know in-house magazine for libertarianism um purely or should we be what they called an outreach magazine of trying to get involved in the larger media conversation and they chose decisively uh on the outreach and i think that was the, the for me uh and i think for the institution the right decision amen all right let's direct this to peter this comes from kevin from cedar rapids with the rollouts of the covid vaccines over the past year when each of you became fully vaccinated what was the first big normal thing he said thing not dog First big normal thing you did entertainment wise. I took a little while to get new dogs uh, this year, but no, uh, the first thing I did was I went back to the movies and I went back to uh, a theater. Theaters in deep Washington, D.C. had been closed for much of last year and for the beginning of this year. And I went back to the Georgetown AMC and I saw the Bob Odenkirk, John Wick film. Oh, uh, right. Nobody, right? People were referring to it as Bob Wick. And it was it was exactly what I wanted to see because it wasn't a great movie, but it was witty and violent, trashy fun. Kind of what I really enjoy about movies in a lot of ways, or just sort of the regularity of movies, something that is just sort of um, a cheap but engaging entertainment uh, that took, you know, it's like, it's like a short movie. It's like 89 minutes or something like that. And I went back and, I you know, this was, I think, nine days after my first shot. So I don't even know if I actually had any antibodies, but I was like, I am done. I'm ready to go. And it was super wonderful just to be sitting there with a friend and with a bunch of strangers who were like watching a movie that we all enjoyed. Nick, what did you do? I don't really remember because yeah. by the time the vaccines came, I had already started reliving my yeah. life for the most part. Yeah. I do remember going to uh, Greenwich, Connecticut. Living in New York City, the theaters were closed. Connecticut opened its theaters briefly. Um, and so I took a train up to Greenwich, Connecticut to see Tenet, uh, you know, the horrible movie. Uh, that was one of the first big movies to come out in a theater, and it was myself and about five other people. Did you fall asleep? Yes, yeah. I did. And the <laughs> real problem was that when I woke up, Tenet was still going on. <laughs> Actually, it had restarted. Yeah. It, I, had it, 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 it doesn't matter. You followed the movie just as well yeah. as the people who had Pretty, stayed I think I got thing. a better, yeah. better. And then it's I also did this. movie, guys. And I, it totally makes sense. It is a horrible movie, and it's, a Chris, it's Christopher Nolan's Walk of Shame. Uh, luckily, nobody saw it. So, uh, and then I did the same thing. I went to New Jersey because the theaters in New Jersey were open, and I went across uh, to uh, Jersey City, and I saw the New Mutants, which had been held on the shelf for like thirty years. Uh, it was so bad, and then they released it when nobody could go, and that too was a disappointment. So then I stopped uh, going to movies, and I decided to live <laughs> life. Damn it! By live life, he means take drugs. Catherine, what did what did you do on your? Uh, I strongly dislike being cold. And so most of my pandemic, like the, the besides, of course, the hundreds of thousands of deaths, uh, the big cost of the pandemic for me <laughs> was that I had to socialize outdoors. And I, I hate being cold. So there was like a lot of dumb, like, we'll all sit around a fire pit with our gloves on and yeah. like pretend like this is Drink okay. Cocktails. Just like so many cocktails. Yeah. It didn't help. And um. So the, the thing that I did after I was vaccinated I'm was sorry, just like, my cocktails always help. Yeah, I mean, it was, that's true. But um, having having people to my house indoors to sit in my house with me yeah. and eat food like that, that's all I want. I'm a simple woman. And uh, and that's what I did when the pandemic was. I was kind of like Nick in that uh, I, like by July of 2020, it was sort of back to normal. And, mm -hmm. and it's just, you, you did what you could get away with. But uh, beyond yeah. that, it was, was sort of doing it. I went back and looked at my calendar to see if there was uh, what was my big activity. And uh, I went to uh, Kat Timp's wedding reception uh, was mm. my first like a, at a speakeasy hotel in New York with all the youths being all youthful and without their masks and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I was already doing things. Um, Eric asks Is that with a K. No, it's with a C. Okay. Uh, not a CK, which is mm. the best form as we all know i fondly remember as a child as the christmas season approached my mother would drop on the coffee table the christmas catalogs from all the department stores can we guess eric's age 
I know. Uh, I would spend an evening. I e- think he's still living with his mom, though. I would spend I'm that. an evening with a red marker circling the items mm. I wanted, then turning that into a written Santa list of my very favorites. Didn't take long before the reality of the Santa falsehood to become yeah. apparent. That's Speaking dark. of therapy, this yeah. is yeah, yeah, this is of uh, the question on the wind up. What would be at the top of your Santa list of things that you would like changed in American government and or politics? Uh, that was a very that was a very Matt Welsh question. It was like, where's this gonna yeah. go? Where's yeah. this gonna right. go? And it's to me. Um, I I think it's just could could we please stop spending all the money? Like I, it's a not a not doing a thing request. Which frankly, I think a lot of things on my real Christmas list would be like, could people please stop doing things? Um, but you know, you never get those under the tree. Sadly, um, I do. Um, yeah, there's there is this sort of like little uh, mini industry in like forums where they ask you how we're going to mm. fix democracy that I've like done many of over the years. And uh, my answer to those is typically some version of like, could we be nicer to each other? Like, could we find ways to be nicer to each other? Um, which is which is essentially a concern about polarization. Like I, I do think, uh, as I've said on the podcast, that that is a thing that is has always been bad, but is sort of a slightly different and worse form of bad than it was before. So I guess what I'm arguing for is more dinner parties inside my house where it's warm. Um, but um, stop spending the money. Like we don't, we are we are super duper out of money. Like, wow, are we out of money? Like, like- But the, we just keep making more. We keep, and yeah. like the inflation is like lurking behind us and the, uh, and the, um, the fact that that seems to matter not at all to the people in charge in Washington is continues to kind of shock and surprise me even after all these years. It's like a column still, but for money, right? You just sort of keep putting more in and then whiskey just comes out the other, or like a Solera system, yeah, it's, it's, right? It's, it's, like, exactly, but that makes exactly. something good. And yeah. this money does not. Nick, you're haunted by the death of Santa. Um, yeah, I was going to I thought we were going to talk about catalogs growing up as a kid because I can tell you that uh, when the Sears wish book would come around, once a year, uh, and it was this fat phone book, and I realize already I'm talking in double things that most people don't remember. Yeah, yeah. but a f- you tell, know, tell a me New about York how a thing City, that doesn't exist anymore resembles a, a thing City that doesn't exist anymore. Phone book, fat, yellow, and 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 uh, white pages together of everything that was available from Sears, and the the great things there, man, and you'll appreciate this, were that you could get any NFL team, any Major League Baseball team, any NBA team. They would have the uniforms yeah. or the shirts. The merch for those teams, which, you know, you were always uh, subjected to whatever shitty metro area you lived in. And I grew up when, you know, the Jets and the Giants sucked and the Yankees and the Mets sucked. And that was like all you could choose from, you know. So I was that was like for me, that was when I started thinking about super abundance without thinking about that. That's I want to live in a world. Where you know you could purchase any NFL team across any, state yeah. lines. Yes, yeah, yeah you know, purchase some with, Vikings gear. And like, like you know, you should be able to uh, uh, purchase uh, health insurance. You know, speaking of health insurance, what's Have your it? what's your big one, Santa? Oh, my big catalog yeah. is Musicians Friend from the 1990s, which I spent hours and hours poring over, like learning the details of every mm-hmm. amp and analog eight track system that was like that was you know sold on the market in 1998. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I became me. Uh, no, uh, mm. <laughs> my uh, uh, it, like, so this is like a this is a stretch goal, as they say. Okay. But it's transform all of the universal old age entitlements into targeted benefits for the poor and uh, special needs people, right? Mm. And to do it over time, I'm not saying like which I, I actually would not if even if I could. Uh, choose to do this like tomorrow, I think that would be a bad idea. It would be bad for the polity, but to like set a date some number of years from now and to no longer have Medicare or Social Security as we as we know them, but instead to have programs that benefit people who have clear needs that are demonstrated um, and to to uh, to make our social spending about that. And that would, in a lot of ways, solve Catherine's problem of spending all the money. It's good. Yeah. We're asking for the same president. I would uh, uh, just channel my inner Clark Neely and say, uh, end coercive plea bargains. Hmm. 
Yeah, that's very specific. Mm. Potentially or Do you have a uh, legal issue that we're going to be learning about in the new year, Matt? Yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, donate to Reason so yeah. that we can pay yeah. for Matt's legal defense. Oh, no. uh, Luke, another great name. Uh, always, yeah. I always like, if we were going to have a boy, I was always uh, uh, arguing for Luke. Luke Welch, that's a good name. Luke Welch is very good. It's like yeah. a mouthful. I don't know. I like Middle name, uh, Skywalker. male names that are one syllable. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, so, uh, the, 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 not lots of nice words about podcast. Uh, oh, oh yeah. Luke donated today. Hey, thanks sent this. Luke. Wow. So this is why Luke got to the front with the line. Not, not only that Luke donated a kidney to reason. <laughs> That's right. We know, uh, we don't think you should have to donate a kidney. We want him to be able no. to sell his kidney on the free market his choice and then give that, us the money. Know, who are we to judge? We, we prefer. That. Luke Luke is thanking us for the excellent podcast. First visit to Reason.com when Eugene Volok and his co-conspirators mm. came over to your site. Like five years ago? It's been a while. Uh, Sounds like it. And since then, I've been consuming more and more of your catalog. Mm. Uh, blah, blah, blah. My question, than musicians, friends. My question is about libertarianism's place in the broader liberal coalition. I think of libertarianism as a fundamental liberal ideology and wish that I could more easily convey that idea to my non-libertarian friends and colleagues on the left. They see libertarianism as a far right ideology, even though many libertarians, myself included, have more in common with those on the left than on the right. So my question is, am I wrong? Does libertarianism have a place in the modern liberal coalition? What is the elevator pitch for libertarianism as a liberal or left ideology? Catherine. I think that uh, the, the the pitch, at least, is to kind of start with what we have in common with people who conventionally identify as left in the United States, which is, um, you know, personal uh, kind of individual freedom, including sexual freedom, freedom to do what you want to do with your body, um, opposition to the war on drugs, opposition to the... Um, overwhelming size and scope of our criminal justice apparatus. Like those all seem like good places to start. Um, but then I actually think like in some ways the way to go is to just rip off the Band-Aid on the places where we really typically disagree with the left and to say, you know, I know that you are skeptical of capitalism and markets, but let me tell you why I think they help the poor. Like I, I, I know that in some ways like that is an argument that people should have heard, but I genuinely think that maybe they haven't yet. And to have it come from someone that they know or trust um, can really be useful. Um, and then we actually have a piece uh, in the upcoming issue by Jacob Sullum, uh, which is about gun control and about how if you oppose the war on drugs, because uh, at least in part because you think it has racially disparate outcomes and has uh, origins in racist ideology, then you should also oppose gun control for those same reasons. Uh, and I think like the two boogeymen of libertarianism for the left are guns and capitalism. So just like get get in there and try to talk about it in language that people on the left. Can I also understand. I think pistol whipping them mm -hmm. with your gun that you, you know that your Second Amendment market. approved gun yeah. is also a pretty convincing argument. Or uh, do we work with the blackjack? What uh, a blackjack is nice that in many sap. states they're not regulated. Yeah, um, a sap. Yeah. Um, I would also uh, think it's it's worth pointing out, you know, libertarianism or classical liberalism, 19th century, 18th, 19th century liberalism is the original liberal position. And as Catherine was talking about, it was a shift of power from, you know, power, you know, hierarchy, authoritarian, tyrannical powers, inherited powers to people, things being devolved to the individual. And it's worth understanding that free market economics or capitalism is the economic application of that principle to one sphere of human activity, but it's not the overwhelming one. But liberals and leftists, and this is more true and is going to become more and more true over the coming years, are very distinct beasts. Most liberals, most Democrats, if you think about somebody like a Bill Clinton or even a Hillary Clinton circa 2000, they agreed that markets were really good at producing more stuff and delivering more stuff to more people. They are not Bernie Sanders leftists who hate capitalism, who hate markets, who hate prices, who hate entrepreneurs and stuff like that. So we actually have so much in common with liberals to say, you know what, like Amazon is pretty fucking great. And wasn't it better to have it during the pandemic than not? We shouldn't be throwing that out as well as then talking about various kinds of social issues and, and 
that idea that, you know what, the best world is where individuals can get along peacefully with each other. And libertarianism, I think, and liberalism properly understood, provides that scaffolding. It's, you know, it's the operating system for a society where lots of people can run their personal life applications without crashing the system. That's the goal. Let's kind of focus on that. You know, what's one thing this person could do? They could donate $100 to Reason's Webathon that we're having right now, mm. and you get a free digital subscription. And maybe they could give that subscription to their friends. I mean, uh, doing, the, uh, doing the the frenemy subscription is uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's always uh, yeah. very important. Uh, Suderman, do you have anything to add to that? I would just add that the way that uh, one of the ways that Reason uh, engages with uh, liberalism and even with the left, uh, I, I think, is just through our coverage in particular of criminal justice and police abuse. And we hit that note every single day and uh, every single week. And that is something that we do specifically just to sort of remind people that we are that we are opposed to state power in all of its forms. And I do relish the grudging tweets that we get sometimes from people about it. Like on the regular, we will get a tweet that's like, say what you want about the mean adjective, mean adjective, mean adjective, mean adjective people at reason. They are consistent on police abuse, criminal justice, whatever. Like th that means more to me than the people yeah. who agree with us generally, that, like the people who also, hate it that we do this well. I think that also gets to the, the distinction between liberals and progressives. And I, I when I joined Reason in 93, this was like a big bugaboo of mine and it's just gotten worse. Liberals don't really care about criminal justice that much. I'm not saying that they should, but they don't really care. You know, whereas like people on the left really care about that kind of stuff. And I think liberals... The sweet spot is going to be more things like, you know, you look at the way markets work, you know, because they tend to be friendly to markets. They're not they're not inimical. And then you kind of show that capitalism is regulating itself pretty well and it actually needs less regulation than you think. And if you believe in things like free speech, because liberals are opposed to identity politics, progressives are going in that direction. There's there's a lot of good overlap there. Um, let's go to a round of individualized okay questions. Peter, could I, before we do that, could I get a splash of your Look Freedom Press wow. coffee? I, Thank you. Oh, that. Uh, maybe I want some of that uh, too. We're just, we're uh, just having a coffee break? As yeah. we're not breaking. This we're, is we're, good we're going. Coffee. This is Wait, live, is this, man. You know, and it's Folgers Crystals. That's what you're telling me? <laughs> you're soaking in it. Yeah. Can't um, believe it. This comes to Dr. Nick Gillespie from uh, Michael Mermack. From Michael Folsom. Mermack. What a false name. It's just made up. It the, sounds made up. The question below uh, is for primary for Dr. Nick Gillespie. Uh, many cultures have national epics, literary compositions that illustrate the sense of life and typical character of a people. For example, Iranians have the Book of Kings, mm -hmm. Shahnameh, and Estonians have Kaylee's Son, and I'm not going to pronounce that word. Uh, number one, as a doctor of literature, does the U.S. have a national epic that sums up the individualist or libertarian character of Americans? You cannot mention to Tocqueville. Yeah. Uh, number two, can the I rest of the, want to. Well, the rest of the panel, we don't need that. Yeah. Let's hear, let's hear. Nick. Uh, okay. Yeah. So what I wouldn't uh, mention Tocqueville, he's, you know, the most overrated oh. figure in American letters. Oh. Absolutely. Democracy in America is kind of interesting, but yeah, you know, wow. what? Do, just like uh, Bernard Henri like Levy, Bernard Henri Levy, you know, like French people know and represent, you know, they understand very little about America. And when they come here, they're almost always wrong. Having said that, I my personal take on this kind of stuff is that the literary genre that kind of defines America for a variety of reasons is the autobiography or the memoir. And it's partly because it's individualistic by nature. Uh, and I would say that the books of my uh, the books to me that I go back to on a regular basis that really I find fascinating and, and kind of tell they're the DNA of a lot of things in America are the captivity narr narrative of Mary Rowlandson, who is a, a, a colonial settler who was captured by Indians and then has a bunch of weird and interesting adventures. And she's writing for an English audience during a, an English Civil War. Fantastic. And that actually is one of the first great works uh, that was written or, or experienced in America, although it was published in London. The Autobiography of Ben Franklin, uh, which is just a phenomenally complicated. He's not a saint by any stretch, but he... His whole thing is he's writing to his son, who would later become the last colonial governor of New Jersey, who he would be estranged from because of the revolution. And he said, I want to show you how I made my way in the world. And it's like the first how to book. And it's about an individual getting on his way. And it's, it's just deep and wonderful. And then in that 
uh, in in that frame of uh, kind of uh, genre or whatever, the autobiographies of Frederick Douglass. There's three three versions of them, but again, he has in that line. I choke up thinking about it. Uh, you have seen, you know, you have seen how I was made a slave. Uh, now I will tell you how how I was I made uh, how I became a man, um, and that is another great work of. Um, self-creation, self-innovation. It's warm, it's empathic, it's deeply moving. Uh, and it's also fundamentally about capitalism. His move from a slave economy to a free labor economy in the North is one of the great moments in that book. And it's also one that current champions of Frederick Douglass and identity politics in the 1619 Project always have to explain away. And in my, uh, my doctoral dissertation, I treated uh, Douglass a bit there were critics, and this was in the late 80s, early 90s, when, you know, uh, when late capitalism was first becoming a real thing, right, be- because people thought the Soviet Union was going to win. Uh, but people would be like, you know, it is a shame that Douglas, for all of his wisdom and insight, that he didn't understand when he left the South and moved to the North and became like a ship cocker in Massachusetts, that he was merely trading one form of slavery for another, meaning making money and keeping it for the work that you do. So those books are great. The other thing that I would say, and we, we talked about this in the 35, uh, 35th anniversary uh, issue of Reason, where we had 35 Years of Freedom, uh, the Little House books are a fantastic, they're in a bad odor now because they were canceled because of some passages that were dubbed uh, you know, um, uh, negative or disparaging towards Native Americans, which is a misinterpretation of the book. But that series is an incredible counter uh, uh, kind of uh, revisionist way of talking about how America was settled, which is by families, not by weirdo, rugged individualist mountain men like, you know, Natty Bumpo who go out and, you know, tame the wilderness and then we follow. It's uh, so I would say those those things are the things I look towards. Can I can I make a suggestion here yeah. um, that's not a book and uh, mm-hmm. not an autobiography of, of any kind, but in fact, the Marvel Cinematic God. Universe, no! and I am not kidding here. I'm God. not kidding at all. These are there's these are all stories of self formation, yeah. um, right? They are about. It starts it out being about billionaires and nerds and inventors and scientists and soldiers, and eventually it becomes also about women and minorities and immigrants and people yeah. from other freaking planets and crazy raccoons and just all of the kind of deep weirdness of humanity and even the things that are that are extra human, right? And it is it is about uh, it's about people who become heroic individuals yeah. and who are constantly struggling both to be good and to be themselves because that is the same struggle. And that seems to me in some ways like the American yeah. struggle. Oh, my God. That's not bad. I, I, I'm halfway there with you. I thought you were going to say The Godfather. I think uh, Frederick Douglass just book. put you in like an in yeah. like a empathetic Fred, mood. Yeah, Frederick Douglass is, uh, you know, he's definitely a superhero. But uh, the one that people aren't that familiar with is the captivity narrative, Mary Rowlandson. And it's really, it's, it's freaking awesome. So this is directed at Catherine. Um, so this comes from, sorry, uh, John Buck. It's the name of one of my uh, best baseball coaches, by the way, John Buck. It's probably not the same person. Um, Though a magazine with libertarian leanings could never become as ineffective and as useless as the FDA, an outsider might get the impression Reason's very own bureaucratic structure. You you firing shots here, John Buck? Uh, Isn't as forward-thinking as they could be. Sure, you're writers and thinkers as opposed to business people, but the wonderful thing about capitalism is those who think outside the box will normally be rewarded in kind. He's getting around the question, I swear. Let's see. We have a monthly print, an easy in addition of reason, a YouTube channel, as well as roundtable interview and Soho Forum debate podcasts that produce on average one show per week. All trend lines point to digital growth. Why not produce a daily roundtable mm. podcast with panels comprised of other writers on the staff, a few of whom already do fill in work when vacations are taken the more content you provide means the more ads that can be placed, the more ads placed, the more revenue you have coming in. I'm not going to hold my breath for a reason streaming channel. Still a great idea. Uh, but the point still stands. The more content you put out there, the more people you reach. Catherine, what do you say about that? I, you're right. And, you know, mm. I think this is a great time to remind everyone who is watching uh-huh. or listening to this podcast that to support more Great Reason content, they mm-hmm. should donate to our Webathon. Uh, do we have anything that we'd like to sort of tease to the, uh, the, the Webathon donors and listeners and viewers and readers of Reason uh, content about stuff that we're going to be pr- 
producing in the future? Yeah. So we, in fact, are going to be uh, growing some of our um, our podcast offerings. So you can take credit for this, John Buck. Uh, you can say that this was all your idea. Um, but we are we are hopefully going to be debuting a few new pods in the next year or so. Uh, you can, of course, also get a little more reason content on your Instagrams and your Twitters, uh, where we have been putting more stuff. And uh, I'm are we not doing dance offs on TikTok saying yet? Saying that TikTok is a thing, but maybe TikTok is a thing. So uh, yes, more reason content coming your way. And again, I love that. No. <laughs> No. Okay, so we're not doing TikTok, it seems. I love that um, seizures people on continue to really believe that like advertising revenue is a big part of our budget. And it is. It does matter. But the thing that actually matters is donations. Yes. Um, tax deductible tax donation. Tax deductible donations to our 501c3. Three. I don't know why I blanked on that the other day. Uh, this one goes mm. to Suderman, who I understand uh, has a bonus uh, newsletter about cocktails. So this would seem appropriate. Uh, David, Denver, thanks in part to your excellent article, How Government Killed the Cocktail. Yes, that was an excellent article. Along with the discovery of bars like the Dead Rabbit in New York and Death & Co. in my hometown of Denver, I've become pretty particular when it comes to my drinking, says David. Do you, Peter Suderman, have an approach to deciding if ordering a cocktail at a particular establishment will be worth it. I find that diamonds in the rough seem to be few and far between and premium prices rarely mean premium cocktails. So I rarely take the gamble anymore if I haven't done prior research. Mm. Was curious if there are things you look for at an establishment to see if their cocktails may be worth trying. Yeah, so that is, uh, you have already discovered the first thing that you discover about like uh, the expensive cocktails is that the fact that they are expensive does not make them good. Neither does weird ingredients or like goofy looking, you know, whole forest garnishes. Even if somebody has spent a whole lot of time like constructing an elaborate, you know, uh, a whole new rainforest to solve global warming on top of your drink, that does not make the underlying cocktail good. Um, so I think that the, the most important thing is to do research and to become familiar with the bars that are highly regarded in any city that you happen to be going to. Death & Company in Denver is, of course, a great bar. Um, Death & Company in New York is my favorite bar in the world. I've learned a lot from them and from their books. But I would say that if you don't know in advance, the two things that you can look for are craft how the, which is just to say, how are the bartenders putting together the drinks? Are they measuring precisely? Are they stirring in a way that seems to be consistent? Uh, shaking in a way that is consistent? Are they shaking more than just sort of uh, one lazy like, sh sh shake, right? Like Catherine occasionally asks me to analyze a shake at a bar and I will like deliver like a paragraph review of the bartender's shake and what, what it tells you about the likely quality of the cocktails. And this is a thing that you can learn to do, especially if you've learned to make these drinks on your own. The other thing that you can look for is, is the bar conversant in the classics? Uh, so do they have Manhattans on the menu? Um, order one. Is it any good? If they can't make a good Manhattan or a good old fashioned or a good martini, whatever your choice of classic is, uh, then they are not going to be able to make other cocktails well. But at that point, you've already spent. So do you beat the check? Do you run out or yeah. do you fake a heart attack well, or take point, a call you, outside you and then just never come back? as a sort yeah. of a... Uh, R and D yeah. on the bar, and you know, you sometimes you uh, you take the loss. Sometimes I just see Suderman like quietly drinking a beer in a bar, mm. and that is like the sickest burn. <laughs> like <laughs> it's just like if you're in a bar that has a cocktail menu, and the yeah. cocktails have like names and stuff, and Suderman is like just holding a beer. Woo! Ouch! There I there are look times for when that is the best option. I look for bartenders who can uh, make cocktails by throwing bottles high up into the air, yeah, like yeah, Tom yeah. Uh, Cruise yeah. and cocktail while dancing they, the hippy hippy shake. Yeah, are they are they dancing yeah. on the bar? Because that is a so sign of awesome. quality. Yeah, yeah. 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 Let's go to some libertarian red meat questions. Matt Beeb from College Station, Texas, right? Yeah. Um, I says, lived uh, fairly close to College Station when I lived in Huntsville, Texas, right. uh, home of the Sam Houston State Bearcats, with and a K. The Death Factory. Yeah. Uh, is the Free State Project all it is advertised to be, Catherine? And mm -hmm. why isn't it more of a mainstream libertarian talking point? So I think the Free State Project in some ways is what it was advertised to be. I think people wanted more from it than what it was advertised to be, if that makes sense. So um, I did not sign on to the Free State Project. Again, see previous comments about hating to be cold, but... Um, mm. I have gone to Porkfest, which is their kind of annual 
a festival gathering, whatever. Um, and it is delightful. Like just a bunch of like weirdos in skirts with like their AR-15 selling you drugs. Like it's just what you imagine. It's just incredible. All background characters from a Guardians of the Galaxy film. Hundred percent. And um, and so in that sense, I think like building that community has been a success. Um, it was all there was always going to be very high attrition for those who don't know. The Free State Project's idea was that people signed a pledge that once a certain threshold was reached, they would all move to New Hampshire and kind of take over uh, whatever amount of the government there they could and make a libertarian utopia. Um, that has not happened, but I do think um, you can see, among other things, in the backlash from normies in like Keene and other places there, that they have had some success. Um, and uh, I think I actually originally learned this from Brian Doherty, that people um, go around feeding the parking meters to prevent the government from getting parking to get money. Like that's like a cultural norm in some places in New Hampshire. So, you know, maybe it's just that I have um, modest ambitions for any project that seeks to fix things via government mechanisms. I think that those very, very rarely work in any form. But um, but the Free State Project, you know, it's actually, I think it's, it's similar to um, crypto, it's similar to Bitcoin, in that it is just an idea that someone had and wrote a paper about that did become a thing in the world. And so I give them credit for that. Yeah, that is cool. And there's always going to be, I mean, the number of libertarians uh, in the in the country is it's hard. It depends on how you measure it. Sometimes sort of 5%, 15%, whatever. Um, uh, but the number of people who self-identify as libertarians enough to move to no, New Hampshire, it's not going to be uh, a million people. Um, so it's just one of many things. And it's nice. We're friendly. Um, let's take this one to Nick. Uh, this comes from Jim from Brooklyn. Mm. Uh, hello, crew. Let's talk 2024 presidential elections. Mm. Let's so he's an optimist. <laughs> let's suppose <laughs> that the Dems go with either Biden or Harris. The Republicans mm. go once again with Trump and the Libertarians nominate Justin Amash. Oh, In that goodness. scenario, what do you think are the odds for a stunning or not very stunning libertarian victory. What other scenarios do you envision in 2024 that could put the LP in position as true contenders for the top job or any other political jobs that rank higher than, say, becoming a constable in Pennsylvania? What are the odds there could be some kind of Republican breakup between Trumpies and more liberty-oriented non-Trumpies? And what would that mean for the LP? I, uh, you know, uh, being serious about this for a minute, I would put, if it's a Mosh versus Biden versus Trump, I would say, you know, the chances of him winning are between 95 and 99 percent. Uh, he would be fantastic. I think he is, from a political perspective, he is the absolute best person who has been involved in libertarian uh, politics ever. Um, and this is not to short, uh, short sh uh, sheet uh, people like Gary Johnson, uh, people like Ed Clark, people like Harry Brown, whatever, you know, whoever Ron you want Paul. to talk about. Ron Paul, certainly. Um, but Amash is the real package for any number of reasons. I think if 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 that's the if that's the scenario, I think it's highly likely that a libertarian candidate with a well-run presidential run would get ten percent easily because the the lack of interest in Trump and the lack of support for Biden is large and growing. Uh, these are old men who represent two worn out, shitty ideals of what politics can do, what the Republican Party or the Democratic Party can do. I hope that they face off again because this is, you know, th will be the third time, at least the third time in a row where the parties are saying, please kill us. Um, and I think but what, what has to go along with that, because, you know, Matt, you and I obviously have written about this at length and whatnot. What has to go along with it is a positive vision of what a libertarian form of government at the national level would look like. And I think Amash brings that because it's based on autonomy. It's based on empathy. It's based on real, uh, you know, on actually constraining the size, scope and spending of government according to principles that we've all agreed to, you know, at various points in our history. Um, and I would love and, and Amash looks like the future of America. He's the son of immigrants. He's he's multi-ethnic. Uh, he is both religious and fiercely, um, you know, non-traditional in the way that he goes about things. And he's mostly interested, you know, to go back to what Peter was talking about earlier, he's interested, you know, that government should help the people who need help. They don't have to help the rest of us. If we're doing okay, we can get on with our lives and we should pay less in taxes and be regulated less. And then we can funnel 
real meaningful help to people. So I think it would be fantastic. I don't have any sense of whether or not Amash is going to run. I don't know if you guys have. He's kind of gone dark, uh, you know, in terms of a lot of his like, ambition. Like spiritually? Or- I, I wish. I wish. No. Uh, yeah. He, I He's mean, he just, he hasn't happen. been talking or it hasn't been as public about this kind of stuff. And there is a real uh, civil war going on in the Libertarian Party, which needs it because the Libertarian Party has not been, you know, for a party that's been around for 50 years, it's kind of going sideways for a while. So, you know, there's the Mises caucus people, there's people like Amash, there's uh, more traditional type uh, people, you know, like something has to happen. And I hope that Amash emerges as a as a viable third party candidate for the Libertarian Party. I uh, will agree with you that if it is Biden versus Trump versus Amash. That uh, that is uh, the maximalist position, I think, for the Libertarian Party because people yeah. don't like Trump except for the people who do. And I don't know if anyone actually likes Biden anymore. But no, there's like, you know they're like vote against a third Trump. and a third, you know, um, that are that are diehards for these idiots, and that and that translates into you know 45, 49 percent for each of them in an election, unless there's somebody like Justin Amash who is really energetic, powerful, thoughtful, ideologically, you know, oriented towards the future. I, I think the chances of that being the three-way race are not very high. Um, I, even though Trump has a, still a lot of sway in the party, I think there will be a, a genuine contest. I think Democrats yep. are already like, oh boy. But they have to, else. the Democrats also have to get rid of two people because there's two dead bodies in the, uh, in the White House right now, or right in Washington, there's him and Harris. And nobody is no, but nobody in the Democratic Party who wants to win the 2024 election is like, yeah, we got to go with Harris. Uh, it's not happening. Um, let us go. Speaking of Justin Amash and science fiction, were we? We weren't. But uh, I, mean, I, will, I was I, thinking about it. I will say a that the scenario uh, in which the Libertarian Party wins a presidential election is indeed science fiction. No, Amash, it, so. Amash and his brother are uh, absolutely ridiculous Star Trek nerds. Mm. Yeah. I think it's Next Generation is their jam. I don't know what that means. Um, but the one that came out in the 1980s and okay. starred my captain, Jean Luc Picard. Okay, oh, well, God. so here's a question from. It's not even American. Faithful listener and correspondent, Leonard, good nights. If that is your real name. <laughs> God, again, these people come up with better pseudonyms. Um, uh, if the roundtablers were a Star Trek bridge crew, who would hold what positions and what species would you all be? Obviously, Peter has to answer this question. Uh, so I'll start with myself, um, <laughs> uh, just because I've been thinking <laughs> about this Did an you, awful wait, wait, I lot. Said, I took yeah. Did you feel the weight of like the wind, like the preparation yeah, yeah, in yeah, that? Yeah. Like, I, uh, let's look at the notes over there. I, yeah, yeah, I blacked out because the oxygen left the room. Do it. Go ahead. Sorry. So, so yeah. as for myself, like in, in some ways, I feel like I'm kind of like Riker, right? Like sort of takes orders, grows a beard in the middle of like, you know, season four, <laughs> uh, sometimes shows up with a trombone, like, oh, okay, yeah. right. But I also feel a lot on this podcast, at least, uh, like Jordy LaForge. And in, actually, maybe maybe more than that, I feel like LeVar Burton reading the scripts that were handed him, because I don't know if you guys know this about how Star Trek The Next Generation scripts were written. We don't. Yes. But there was a lot of like techno babble on this show, right? The tachyon emitters were always out of phase. Mm-hmm. Except the writers wouldn't write the tachyon emitters are out of phase. They would just write two brackets and then the word tech in between them. And the science advisor would have to come in and fill in like, no, it's the tachyon emitters again. Of oh, course. Right. And I feel like my role on this podcast is often just like, Matt, you're like, <laughs> Peter, tech. So so I, I kind of feel like Jordy Laporte. Who there. was um, the who was the guy with the uh, horseshoe crab on his forehead? Worf. Thank you. Uh, you mean the Klingon? So I don't know who the Klingon is here, no. um, but I do the think- Klingon The Klingon is our audio producer, yeah. Ian. Yeah, no, that's, that's that's actually oh, yeah. absolutely yeah. correct. Who promised um, me a can of tactical bacon if I said that on this podcast, I will be collecting. What is tactical I, uh, bacon? I don't know, don't yeah, you wanna I, know? I, I, you know, open it, open it in a field by yourself, okay? It's either Just don't open it in the bacon office. that's a weapon or it's bacon yeah. that can be used after all the weapons yeah. are out of bullets and either way it's great. So um, I think uh, Nick actually here is Q. He's he's not a member of the main cast. He is simply the no. most interesting um, uh, supporting character who comes to the who he like shows up on the bridge. He's a godlike mm. uh, alien being who shows up on the bridge in, to like taunt the captain 
um, and also make some really good points at the same time uh, and wear goofy mm -hmm. costumes. And sometimes there's a mariachi band involved. Uh, it's always wonderful when John Delancey shows up. I think Matt Welch here is not from The Next Generation, but Matt Welch is from the original series and you are Dr. McCoy. Oh, you are bones. You are, crack, you are bones. Yep. Crack my right. knuckles and jump for joy. You are. You, you've 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 got that sort of. I'm not that cranky. You, you're you've got that that cranky, exasperated vibe. But you also like are oh, a crucial Kirk. part. He's of, Kirk. Uh, he's he's Kirk. he's a hundred percent Bill. Shannon. I'm not making out with everybody. No, that and I think I think <laughs> I here know. we have uh, we have both Kirk and Picard in the form of Captain oh, Picard, but not the lady captain. Nobody likes the lady captain. I yeah, I don't know why. Yeah, do you, why not? Do you, we because actually, she's a lady. We probably the sexism. Yeah. Um, no, we previously explored this question. Y'all may remember um, when Freedom Fest was Star Trek themed, oh, right. and there was yeah. a brief period where we seriously considered acquiring Star Trek costumes oh, right. and yeah, appearing yeah, yeah. on stage as our as various characters. Yeah. It luckily. That did not occur, and I think we can all agree wow. that was for the best. You're, uh, I uh, I want to make a pitch. He's not a, on the bridge in any yeah. of the shows, but the Gorn. I want to be the Gorn. <laughs> you know, the Gorn is this lizard-type creature that basically spends half an episode getting pelted by large styrofoam boulders by William Shatner in the San Fernando Valley. In the greatest <laughs> like, uh, fight scene yeah. ever filmed. You should just Google it's, it. Star Trek Gorn fight scene. Yeah. He, so Kirk yeah. has a move. In which ah. he balls his two hands yeah. into like a rock <laughs> over his head and yeah. tries yeah. to smash the Gorn's head, and you're like, "How? That's not fighting. That's I don't know what that is, but it doesn't like." But it worked. It ultimately yeah. works. That was a, that was a uh, '70s uh, fight. In yeah, yeah. TV, uh, yeah. Bad TV you were shows. always you hitting. Two, he does something similar with Khan as well. Yeah. But uh, the fight scene with between Gorn and Kirk also eerily anticipates uh, Muhammad Ali versus George Foreman oh, in Zaire. Uh, it's it's almost the same. It's, it's almost you know uh, uh, step by step. It's 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 a complete ripoff. She's not here today, but she is a recurring guest on this podcast. So I will just say that Stephanie Slade is obviously Spock. Mm. That's true. obviously. Um, since we already started this, and since I know at least one of us have spent a lot of time, maybe all four, uh, rehearsing uh, or researching this question. This is from Molly. Uh, what three? fictional characters describe you three nick you obviously come up with that. What, 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 what? I, I really uh was totally stymied by this and i had a quick confab with people i used to respect yeah. uh, just before this podcast <laughs> well, to get to ideas. Me, yeah. well like i said matt i you know i used to respect yeah. okay right, so yeah. uh, maybe i still respect you or maybe i never respect yeah, you, you can go options. either way so i don't have any good answers for this i did one of the uh uh uh, Game of Thrones quizzes that Catherine suggested that we look at, and I turned out to be, of course, Peter Dinklage yeah. from Game of Thrones, and I think that's a pretty tight fit. I have been likened to, uh, you know, the Fonzie. I'm the free market Fonzie. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like that, especially because I jumped the shark sometime <laughs> in the early '80s yeah. when the Happy Days crew was running a dude farm out in uh, a dude ranch out in uh, California. Uh, the, to be a little bit more uh, pompous, I like to, one of my favorite characters, Hello. yeah, thank you, uh, uh, in um, in literature is the uh, Hickey character in the Eugene O'Neill, The Iceman Cometh, uh, because uh, it's set in a bar, I think I've mentioned this, because Donald Trump, I figured as a Hickey character, set in a bar where there's a bunch of bar flies who are all sitting around just drinking all the time, talking about how when things get right, they're going to do all of these incredible dreams. And this traveling salesman named Hickey, who was originally played by Jason Robards Jr., comes in and he disabuses them. The play, which is about 10 hours long, he just t spends time destroying each of their dreams by saying, like, you're never going to do that, and et cetera. And then he is revealed. And because the play is, you know, 100 years old, I feel safe ruining it for people. But then it is revealed at the end that Hickey, who is himself a major booze ad, has murdered his wife and maybe a couple of other people and get and gets hauled off. And so exit the scene. And I have a lot of empathy for Hickey. I like the way that he, you know, he forces people to be realistic about themselves. Hopefully you can do that in a way that actually empowers people to do their dreams. And then he's revealed as, you know, a uh, as bad as the rest of them actually works. This folds in with my uh, obvious go to with Nick is the he's the, the no country for old men. Yeah. Anton Churger. Churger. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Catherine, what are your answers to this question? Another agent of chaos like you. Yeah. 
Uh, so the reason staff a while back took the like an online what fictional character are you quiz like collectively, this is um, my greatest temptation as a manager. I would make people take yeah. like all manner of personality tests, except uh, for that I recognize that so A, they would hate Briggs me. Meyer, it's any, like, all of them, yeah. any of them. Like no. I just love that stuff, even though yeah, I know your it's Enneagram? mostly bullshit. Mm -hmm. And um, I- Which Nazi from Hogan's Heroes are you most like? Not the BuzzFeed ones, yeah. the pseudoscientific yeah. ones. That's my jam. <laughs> and um, on this on this quiz, I do come up as um, Olena Tyrell, which y'all mm -hmm. may remember from Game of Thrones as the old lady who in the end says like, I want her to know it was me. Like the really- oh, that's Diana mean, Rick. The mean- right? Um, mastermind old lady, uh, which feels right to me. Um, other results on this quiz that I got include uh, Hermione Granger, sorry to say, Ooh. but that's just the truth. Yeah, that's okay. And uh, Mycroft Holmes, Sherlock oh, Holmes's smarter uh, brother, brother, who's yeah. smarter, uh, but who prefers to work from the chair. He doesn't mm. like to do the legwork mm -hmm. and is perhaps <laughs> the British government. And then also every lady CEO in all of TV. <laughs> Like oh, wow. you name them, they came up in my top ten. Like, and yeah. it's it's you know what? Who like, are it the is, lady CEOs? It is on what TV. it is. Uh, like we got the Shiv Roy's. The oh Olivia yeah. Popes, oh no, that's the so... Charlotte Hale from Westworld. Okay. Uh, yeah, like yeah, just that's pretty good. All of the sort of sinister lady CEOs uh, in the Marvel universe. You're not sinister. My thank you. Oh, that's what you have totally. to say. Or I'll kill you. Yeah. Um, in Look, the Marvel universe, you could see him sweating yeah. while he's saying that. I get so, unbuttoning um, down to yeah. BHL level. <laughs> Doctor Strange is the is the Marvel universe universe result that I get. Wow. Are you a secret watch you're, guy? You're wow. Lady Loki. We've, we've, we've covered that. Yeah. I'm just saying that's not what showed up on I think you should go deep on the whole Diana Rigg, her character. I mean, her whole like from the Avengers. I accept every, and, yeah, I accept every character. So um, great. I will say that my, my Star Trek result, which I don't know what it means, is uh, Jadzia Dex. Ooh. Mm. So Jadzia Dex is... Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jadzia Dex is... Um, a uh, like a host parasite situation in which yeah. like a little worm thing goes into a new body every like uh, eighty or ninety years, and sometimes the worm thing goes into a man, and sometimes it goes into a woman. But it's like it, it could be either at any point is mm -hmm. is sort of the point here, and there's a and, and there's sort of a duality to it because the host also changes the personality each time, so and nice. she's got super cool neck tattoos. Yes. I think Matt, you as a Star Trek person, you are Charlie X. Do, oh. Peter, do you know, remember who Charlie X is from the original series? Wait, is that the one who turned out to be uh, uh, Jack the Ripper? No, no, no. Charlie X is a uh, is an, uh, a a man who is actually has the mind of a child and then gets very angry oh, I do all the time. That, and yeah. like at, in one famous scene, it's the only reason to watch the original series. To be quite honest, is he uh, he uh, gets that, mad at a woman a uh, at a woman uh, you know in a Friends. in a blue. I think, mini dress. I think we're and she turns around <laughs> and she doesn't about? have a face anymore. <laughs> Reminder: he that doesn't. This is she the doesn't reason, have a face anymore. The reason why and she gets we pulled out. He gets reason. pulled out you by his. You should donate to Reason. Yeah. Uh, speaking of cool neck tattoos, if you give Played us fifty dollars, Robert Walker you're just Jr. Still talking. Oh, so, if you so give good. us fifty dollars, you get a temporary tattoo with the Reason logo, and it's pretty cool. So you you could. Practice I'll just say that Charlie well, X is better than Malcolm X, <laughs> but they're both revolutionary. Uh, I want to cast Matt and Nick as Zaphod Breibelbrox from uh, How yes. Dare You, Sir. Of the Galaxy. How Ooh. dare you? A kind of a, a like he's a two-headed con mm. man who is is occasionally the president of the galaxy, but I usually not. I very much feel like the trillion yeah. tier Zaphod sometimes, guys. I don't know what these people yeah. are talking about. But uh, you Peter, do like the thing with two heads, right? The oh, uh, Rosie Greer, uh, Ray Milland movie from the early <laughs> uh, 70s. Guys, come on, get it come together. On. Rosie Greer taught us one yeah. important thing in life and that it's all right to cry. Peter, you have 10 seconds to say which three <laughs> characters you are in. My top character on that quiz that everybody took was Varys from Game of Thrones, who uh, I'll just let you all figure out what you think of that. Um, I would just note that the top, like, top 10 character across the Reason staff was Ian Malcolm from Jurassic Park. And I really think that's accurate. Like there is a huge amount of Ian Malcolm DNA in the Reason Which, staff. Which, who is Reason he? Talk. Life uh, that's the Jeff, no, uh, Jeff, that's Jeff Goldblum, Goldblum character. character. Yeah, 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 sure. Uh, the rock star scientist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's working it out in like real time. Who yeah. speaks in jazz. Yeah. I uh, obviously identify the most in the world of uh, fiction with uh, the dude from The Big Lebowski. Like it's, mm. it's always been an aspirational situation sure. with me, just fashion and uh, and musical taste. Um, and, but I took the, the dumb quiz and I turned out to be uh, uh, Remy from Ratatouille. Yeah. 
Oh my god. Wow. It's is incredible. that the rat or the, the guy? It's the, oh, okay, the, yeah. the rat. He okay. wants to be a chef. All he wants to do is be a chef. Well, he has a dream yeah. has to a dream. be great at his at his craft, and also he likes French ladies. No, oh, and he's a rat. Um, all right, <laughs> let's uh, let's try to get some uh, quick policy under the yeah. under the deadline here. <laughs> now that we've covered the good stuff. Uh, my question is this: Following the George Floyd protests and BLM movement in 2020, there was a moment where criminal justice and policing reform seemed imminent. Has that moment been snuffed out for good? Or is it closer to a Matt Welch mixed metaphor where the flame still burns on a twisted ocean of rocky shores? Um, I I don't Mm. see the problem with that. Specifically, what could end qualified immunity? One of the worst presidents in our uh, criminal justice system. Catherine. Uh, I am a little pessimistic at the moment, but I think that um, this is probably, hopefully this is the sort of thing that... um, the idea has been planted. The seed is planted in the rocky shores mm-hmm. and it's winter now, but the seed will bloom again in the spring when conditions are better. And so maybe this is we've, we've sort of made some steps in the right direction uh, across the ocean of despair. Most of the stuff happens locally. Um, mm-hmm. Most new administrations work on their big one, two or three things at the beginning. And that's all they pay attention to when all those stop. Um, then maybe they'll pay more attention federally and hopefully they will get that this, qualified This is also a good, I mean, qualified immunity should go, obviously. Uh, police union should be uh, broken in various ways. But this is also a good example of where custom is more important than law. The laws on the books will be, take forever to change, but I think police are acting more circumspectly and people are demanding more. And that you know, we we are seeing a difference in the way that people go about their business because of all of the attention that's been called to this. Um, all right. Uh, this uh, question is very important. It comes from Joseph Hinshaw. Um, what's your favorite reason rat joke? I should say at reason rat. It's a Twitter mm-hmm. account. And what's the story behind it? Um, there, There is no such thing as a reason rat joke. They are all just real things that were said by a reason staffer occasionally slacked or slacked by a reason staffer um the uh the account is manned by a by an anonymous person we do not know who the reason rat is has there um, been an attempt to smoke there probably but rat it's Augusta? it's the reason rats um, Pierre Delicto. anonymity remains secure um but you can follow it on twitter and hear the nonsense things that we say um, they are mostly just like delightfully out of context quotes. Um, but the the story behind it is that our office was infested with rats and it still is a little. And if that's not a reason to donate <laughs> to <laughs> the Webathon, I really don't know what is. Uh, we are in DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C. We have a very cool historic building and man, mm-hmm. we got rats. Mm-hmm. We got a lot of rats, um, including one that was once discovered inside our coffee maker please that, give us yeah that. yeah that, that was that, the that, that. that was the ultimate. there's a reason some of us work in new york city oh yeah i know rat 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 yeah. 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 you you literally came up with remy on your test results don't be <laughs> <laughs> don't be snippy you're so self-hating man. uh this one probably could be bounced between uh peter and Catherine, although uh, i'm sure nick has things to say as well from aaron would you recommend any writers or other resources for analyzing science fiction through a libertarian lens. I love to hear from y'all how Asimov's foundation novels, which I've loved since I was a teen, reflect the monstrous, technocratic, borderline totalitarian view of the world. And I want to hear more. Uh, can we talk about Asimov for a minute, yeah. Peter? Yes. Yeah, I know. Asking you that okay, was like so a short thing. so that means you need to keep it short. No, I'm just saying for a minute, because you guys will talk for hours. We'll talk for Asimov. hours. Um, I, uh, I actually think it is true that Asimov's vision is monstrous and totalizing, but that it is not, it does not present that sort of totalitarian world as, um, a pure utopia that a lot of his stories are about the ways that, um, centralizing and automating things that were once human and messy, uh, has, will not totally work out. Um, my favorite Isaac Asimov short story, which I think I've talked about before, it's called Franchise, and it um, was probably inspired by the fact that the um, famous real computer Univac correctly predict- predicted the um, 1952 presidential election. And so Asimov wrote a short story about uh, future elections in which a single human is brought in, 
sort of asked a bunch of questions just to build in human irrationality uh, to the result. And then Multivac, um, it was Asimov's kind of supercomputer, um, determines the outcome of the election. And I think that like that to 13 year old me blew my mind, like immediately explains a lot about politics. Probably there's a straight line from that story to my views that you should not vote today. Um, and, uh, and it's a classic Asimov in that it's, it's, it is monstrous and totalitarian, but it also shows the ways in which that world m misses the mark or sort of, you know, has, has a hole at the center of it. Um, in terms of resources, I would just say Libertarian Future Society, which mm. um, gives out Prometheus Awards every year, a great way to just like build up your libertarian science fiction reading list. I would just say read biographies of your uh, favorite writers because the biographies, even if they are critical, even if they are not focused on the writer's politics, they will inevitably cover some of those political influences and the uh, fractious political nature of writing science fiction in the uh, or in the 1900s in, in the United States because all of those folks were involved in science fiction political societies or political societies that became science fiction societies or science fiction groups that, that broke up and fractured and became multiple other groups because of politics. And so just understanding the history there and the kind of milieu that they were involved in is really important to understanding their politics and how to think about them through the lens of politics. Yeah, I would say, uh, following up on that, the bio, uh, there's some biographies of Robert Heinlein, who yeah. is great. And Heinlein, in a lot of ways, uh, Brian Doherty, 10, 15 years ago, wrote a great piece of it on the 100th birthday of, of Heinlein. Heinlein is kind of the spirit animal of, of reason as yeah. much as Ayn Rand might have been because he is, you know, at the beginning of the 60s, he was both a militarist as well as a free love advocate. He was, a, you know, a, an Aquarian and a, uh, and a, you know, a war hawk. And that is, you know, that's a powerful uh, vibe throughout uh, modern libertarianism. You can understand a huge amount about yeah. Reason's worldview just by reading Stranger in a Strange yeah. Land and The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Which, Stranger in a Strange Land, was the topic of my high school uh, uh, thesis uh, essay. Your uh, high school thesis? Yeah, in English. Kind of fancy had, high school. You yeah, what is that? Uh, well, you're just supposed to, it was just a, was a, that a, a three-page paper? It was, uh, I showed it to you. Was it a five-paragraph essay? It's called The Martian and the Hippies, and it was yeah. about uh, how Stranger in a Strange Land uh, informed and predicted the summer of love in 1967. Wow. It's all about the diggers. Do you still have that? I do. Yeah, I do. Uh, the writing is uh, is subpar, but the thinking is, really? is outstanding. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Matt Wait, is it is it handwritten or typewritten? Eighteen year old over. Yeah. What kind of margins you got on that? Um. Uh, no, like is pretty it pretty squeezy? Actually, I, I, yeah. I, I don't. I can't. Uh, I can't recall that. Let's example. upload it as a PDF. Uh, my yeah. my as an NFT. My uh, stepfather, uh, mm. uh, Mike Townsend, who is probably not listening to this, but I hope that he is. Um. Uh, he came into my life when I was around 12 and like, it's like he, he had two big gambits. Like one was the, the Ayn Rand gambit and the other one was the Robert Heinlein oh, wow. gambit and the Ayn Rand, boy, that didn't stick. But uh, I went, I got into the Heinlein. Mm. So that was, uh, that was helpful. Um, let's take this more like for me and Nick for reasons that'll easily become obvious from Philip. With all due apologies to certain members of the round table, I'd like to ask <laughs> a sports question. I love the free markets, which have given you guys, us. You guys want to take five? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Why don't you go let's stretch Actually, out. let's only use that camera yeah. <laughs> to show them. And it should have been the same thing. That with actually, it. if people do ask me about yeah. that, they're like, when you say like, uh, oh, what, what is it like to make the podcast? They always specifically ask like, what are you doing while Nick and Matt are talking nonsense? So I imagine it's like when Chang and Ang, the Siamese twins, when, you know, they were both married and when one of them would have sex, the other wow. one would kind of go into a, a twilight zone and not really... I'm That's what I'm assuming you guys do when we talk about by that comparison. Oh, I'm thank sorry. You. I should have called them conjoined twins. Yeah, I, thank my, you. My, <laughs> thank you. I apologize. Um... Moving on, uh, I love what free, was the, yeah, I, what I love was the free the markets, which have given us so many wonderful things. But I instinctively balk at extending yeah. this love to the concept of paying college athletes. I'm not opposed to paying them mm. altogether, but my brain immediately wants to condition it with gasp, wage ceilings and floors, heavy regulation of recruiting practices, sponsorships and donor involvement, and other authoritarian seeming limits that would absolutely horrify me if applied to any other economic activity. I realize the reasons I think these things would be necessary in college sports are the same reasons that socialists think they are necessary everywhere, protect competition, level the playing field, limit the power of the wealthy, empower small business, 
in this case, small schools, etc. And that scares me. Do the challenges of college sports and athlete labor actually make a broader case for socialism? Uh, Dr. Nick, uh, am I wrong to think strict controls would be necessary to pay college athletes while still keeping their sports fair? Or do college sports and broader economics legitimately call for different solutions? Uh, one, I would not argue that, uh, you know, whatever happens in college football, that's the universe. Like these two things, yeah. you, you don't have to leap from one to the other. Uh, college sports and different divisions could be laboratories of democracy, uh, yeah. of economic democracy and things like that. But I and I also don't understand how it's better to have them in a form of peonage now where they really don't. I mean, there's some of the likeness, you know, where NCAA athletes can can get some money be, if they're popular based on their likeness or their schools can. That comes back to them somehow like giving them some money would be worse than giving them no money, which is the status quo. And the status quo is also it has been super heavily yeah. regulated. There's all these yeah. arcane rules that the NCAA does to to maintain the illusion that there aren't uh, incentives from outside donors and money polluting the system. The more, money. Yeah. And, yeah. and more broadly, you know, let's say that uh, the NCAA, which is a monopoly and there's uh, uh, there's a great book that was written by the uh, Olympic marathoner turned fantastic sports journalist, Kenny Moore, about Bill Bauer. It's called Bill Bowerman and the uh, the men of Oregon. He was the Oregon track coach when Steve Prefontaine was there, he, you know, dozens of Olympians, world champions, et cetera. Um, it, it, what, what was great about that book is it actually shows how the NCAA squeezed out the AAU in the 60s. Oh, right. And it's, it's fascinating. But having said all of that, because these guys are starting to go to sleep and cobwebs are forming on them, um, all sorts of submarkets have rules. Uh, you know, so Major League Baseball, apart from you know, the government grant of monopoly on certain things, or football, you can come up with a league where you say, okay, we're, we're going to have a bunch of rules. The New York Stock Exchange has rules and things like that. So there's nothing wrong with a league or a group of people can, you know, coming together to do a certain activity, setting rules on compensation that implies that the whole world should be run by a socialist you know, covenant uh, based in Zurich or something like that. I think it would be good if athletes were more directly compensated for their labor. Um, I also think it would be great, and I say this as somebody who really was pissed when Michigan finally beat Ohio State for the first time in 11 years. On Sunday, I follow college football pretty religiously. I think it would be great if colleges got rid of their sports teams or, or gave the naming rights to autonomous organizations, put them on the blockchain, make them DAOs or something like that, but get sports out of college. Having said that, it'd be, it'd be great to see athletes actually being compensated. Yeah, they create value. They should get paid. Um, and, uh, and that should be fine. And the uh, Supreme Court, the unanimous decision this year, um, uh, laughed at these puny uh, kind of uh, arguments the, 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 you know, about the pristine nature of amateur athletics and all that kind of stuff. Stop it. Um, we're getting close to the end. I want to get a, at least one more round of individualized um, things here. This to Suderman from Steve Schatz from New York. Nick, come on. Uh, what video game or video game series is the most libertarian, both thematically and actual gameplay? Mm. Oh, man. Obviously, the Bethesda RPGs, uh, in particular, Fallout 3, Fallout 4, and Elder Scrolls uh, Skyrim. Uh, Elder Scrolls Skyrim, in particular, I would just uh, say, is um, it, it's, a, it's a game about individual choice. And so after a very short kind of tutorial introduction sequence, you can do anything, go anywhere, manipulate nearly any object in the world in a way that's really unprecedented in uh, games that aren't made by, uh, by Bethesda. Um, but also... The overarching story here is about a world in which you have some kind of racist seeming white Nord types who just want to practice their religion. And that's really all they want to do is be left alone by the uh, kind of imperious, kind of uh, dickish high elves who have taken over the society. And you have to choose between one of these two camps. And the point is that they're both awful. Uh, and so, like, I don't want to say that this is an explicitly libertarian game made by libertarians who live just north of Washington, D.C., uh, but it is a game made by a bunch of people who live not too far from the nation's capital, capital, and it is alive to the dumbness and frustrations of politics, as well as, like, the glories of, of being in a world where you can choose to do and be anything. Um, question to Catherine from Nathan, and hopefully there's a backstory, and hopefully there's not even. Uh, it says, uh, I have a question specifically for KMW. How dare you? 
Mm. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Spicy, Nathan. I don't I don't know. Yeah. What uh, does that mean? Yeah. Nevertheless, I persisted. I, I don't know, mm. man. How dare I? Okay. Um, you know, you know what I do dare Maybe to do. Maybe it's a like a an instructional question. How dare you? Yeah, yeah I, it could be. Mm. Yeah, um, ways to you, go. you know what I do dare? To, I do oh. dare to um, just put in another um, plug. You know, plug here yes. for our webathon. Excellent. There are many ways you this. can. There are many ways you can donate. If you donate a thousand dollars, you could have lunch with one of us mm. here in the in the DC area. And if you donate two thousand dollars, you don't, you have, don't have, to. have to. Yeah, yeah right? those yeah. are your two choices. Yeah. <laughs> um, and. Um, uh, you can also go ahead at this at this webathon moment and set up monthly mm. donations. That's if you want right. to give recurring. us a little money now, you could make a recurring donation. It would be great. We would appreciate it. And that that money will allow me to dare. Well the done. monthly the monthly option is great. I actually use it in in much of my giving, both to reason and elsewhere, because it's you know, yeah. it's a little bit at a time. It's a it's a great like um yeah. if you have to make the choice every time, you're not gonna make the choice yeah. even though you want to make the choice. Uh this one to Nick from Stuart. Hello, big fan of the show. Listen every week. That's right. Stuart, thank you. Is it uh with an EW or a UA? Because it's an e I'm, it's I'm not gonna answer if the depending on how the spelling goes. EW. Okay. All right. We're on. Um my question is, a few weeks or months ago, Nick made a comment, more or less, that this might be the proof that Keynesian economics doesn't work. He didn't elaborate what he meant by that. I'm really curious as to what he meant by that and what examples he'd provide. I have no idea <laughs> what he's talking about, but I'll, I'll venture a guess Go. because one of the things, and this goes back to, uh, you know, we at some point early in this, which to quite honestly feels like a thousand years ago when we started this thing. Um, but just today. Like this, yeah, this like this podcast. podcast. Yeah, this particular podcast. And I, uh, um, but we touched on inflation briefly. What is fascinating to me about what's going on right now is that everybody in Washington and all of the big wig economists who want to be part of Washington or already are, are talking about this completely as a supply issue that uh, you know, what's happened now that we're all done with COVID, even though all the lockdowns are coming back and all of this kind of shit, they're saying, you know, what happened? And there's so much pent up demand and supply hasn't been able to increase. And that's why there's inflation, you know, more or there's more people looking at the same supply of stuff. They keep ignoring the idea that we have pumped massive amounts of government money into the system, both through the Fed, but especially through uh, the Treasury, through through borrowing in order to spend all of this kind of stuff. Uh, two years ago, or in 2019, we were spending 4.5 trillion. We've had two years in a row where we've spent close to seven trillion dollars, and that's a huge problem. What I'm getting at about the Keynesianism stuff is that we're not having economic growth. We have had a sustained, bizarre kind of experiment in Keynesianism, where the government is just pumping more and more money to, you know, stimulate demand or to give people money to buy stuff, et cetera, for so long. And we have not seen, even going back to the 2008 financial crisis and the response to that, we haven't seen the kind of economic growth that should have come along with this type of consistently overly, you know, uh, targeted stimulus spending. So maybe it's that. Uh, we're going to be wrapping up here very shortly. Thank you for listening and watching um, and for donating. Reason.com slash donate, right? Or slash webathon. Or slash yeah. webathon. Yeah. Both of them work. Mm. Um, go there. It's fun. Um, I don't know if this will be our closing one. It might be, depending on how it's answered. <laughs> this is from Peter, not Suderman. He's from uh, New York City. I've got a life advice question for you. How important would you say your political philosophy is toward your dating life? <laughs> <laughs> I've never dated a libertarian because there's like three women who consider themselves libertarians and they all worked at Reason. But someone's, that's not true. Um, some of them don't work at Reason. Uh, but someone's politics never really mattered when I met them or dated them. But I imagine there could be some conflict in a marriage when I have kids because politics is a reflection of how you see the world. I doubt I could have a successful relationship with someone totally woke, but maybe I'm wrong. How important is it? And since you're all much older than I, Ooh. I'd like to hear your thoughts. And if you think your answer changed versus 20 years ago, who wants to take that? Oh, that's interesting. I'll go first because mm. that's happening. Um, so I actually, um, I met my husband in college and we met a in yacht. a, it was, there were no yachts involved. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
There was one. Yeah. There's yeah. one yacht just based one. activity. Just one. Uh, okay. But mostly it wasn't a yacht based relationship. And um, we met in a debating society where we were both on the uh, libertarian side of a kind of libertarian anarchist uh, versus traditionalist Catholic conservative um, uh, spectrum. Where did you go? Yale? All right. Uh. All right, everyone. And. Um, we how was ross and that we debate? were for we were we were i would debate allies first uh-huh. and then friends and then we got together and then we got married and then we had kids and it's a very nice story and all of this is to say that that happened so long ago that i no longer remember what dating was like but uh it's really great to be married to someone who agrees with you politically i think this person is onto something that like that is a way to um, have a better and easier relationship. Uh, we still disagree on some stuff, but um, the like disagreeing from shared underlying values is the best kind of disagreeing. And uh, and my marriage has a lot of that, and I recommend it. So get yourself a nice libertarian girl. There's tons of us now. I used to get invited to all kinds of stuff just because like someone needed a lady on a panel, and they're like. So many ladies now. I don't. I never get asked to be the token lady anymore, and so it's good. Peter, you're married, aren't you? That's true. In fact, I am married to a libertarian uh, who I mm. met in the backyard of a, a a blogger house party in Washington D.C. And I'm not going to say who, but definitely uh, someone that Catherine was debating with. Uh, no, um, I think I know who it is. But uh, I'll just say that um, you know, check the uh, Substack charts. Um, Mm. So uh, I don't know why I get mocked, by the way. <laughs> like that's, what do you mean? Oh, that's like, a, a terrible, like, appalling story. Blah, that blah, we, blah, yeah, it's like that story is more yeah. elitist that than we my can, story. We have to turn away from that okay. story. Yeah. Turn so your face away. Go ahead. Sorry. So my wife is a libertarian journalist mm. and writes about this sort of thing, uh, but also is a, I, I, I think it's fair to say, applies her libertarian philosophy uh, somewhat differently than I do at times. Uh, and this Does is, that mean that you pay for sex? Wow. Just ask. We were so close to the I, end of this podcast. I don't know. I mean, everyone, I everyone Markets and everything. Everyone markets and everything, right? In some sense. It's like market-based management, but for marriage. of the currency yeah. you're using. Really. That's true. Yeah, yeah. I really hope that we only have Mets. Yeah. Like, and <laughs> yeah. cover yeah. on the, the shot as, yeah. I, as all of this is happening. Uh, no, mm. it's. It's valuable to have somebody else in the house who thinks in, uh, from the same uh, principles, as Catherine was saying, but applies them differently. And because we both write about this stuff all the time, we talk about this sort of thing all the time. And I think that that is, um, I think that's something that helps. It, it keeps me thinking, right? It's it's not just that, uh, it, so I don't just sort of show up to work and, and then like stop thinking about this stuff when I'm done. At night, when we're having dinner, when we're uh, you know we're, when we're watching Succession, we're talking through all of these things, um, and that means that there's always someone there to bounce ideas off of. And if you are a writer, particular uh, a writer, particularly a writer who sort of traffics not just in kind of straight formal reporting, but in ideas and concepts and sort of ways of thinking about the world and about politics. The best way to shape your ideas is to have conversations with other people who. Uh, are interested in your ideas, but think a little bit differently than you. And so having someone like that is just incredibly valuable. And I think it makes me a better thinker, um, a, a better writer. It means often that I'm exposed to ideas and uh, and and just to facts and stories that I wouldn't have heard of otherwise, because here is somebody who with, with a, a different set of interests, a different way of looking at the world, but one that starts from a lot of the same premises. And, it, and it's great. Strongly recommend if you can find uh, a... Uh, you can find a fellow libertarian journalist in the mm. backyard of a DC blogger house party. Put a chain on it and keep it in the basement. Um, Consensually. Uh, of course. Yes, All the, you're a doctor uh, of dating. I, uh, well, I divorced from a libertarian, more of an anarchist than a libertarian, and I've had long-term relationships mostly, yeah, in the past 25, 30 years have been the long-term relationships I've had have been with libertarians. So I feel like we're rubbing it in. I know. Because between this question us, was like, is it going to be okay if I don't find a libertarian yeah, lady? Yeah, yeah. Like, and it's, it's like okay. the libertarian lady okay. is is already taken. But um, yeah, it's- <sighs> it's I dated several but, libertarian ladies before I met the one this, who became my what, wife. What I would this say to this mistake. gentleman, <laughs> no, to, <laughs> was it Peter was Peter. his name? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. What Peter, what I would say is first off, like don't worry about this kind of stuff so much. 
be interesting and be, uh, you know, if, you, if you're interesting yourself and you're interested in other people, good things will happen to you. I don't think that um, necessarily like being in a relationship with a libertarian is the be all and end all. Uh, and you want to be with somebody who is, you know, who you are compatible with and politics can do that. But it's also sometimes you want something different, you know, or, or I mean, and part of me for me, part of the libertarian philosophy is the idea that it's a refuge from politics. Like, you know, you're not always talking about politics. You're not always talking about this. It's pre-political. And if you find somebody who is interested in kind of a laissez-faire kind of light, you know, approach to the world, they don't need to be, you know, libertarian in some way or Misesian or, you know, Hayekian or anything like that. I think it's, you know, mostly you find somebody who you have a lot, you share a lot of interests with and a certain compatibility on a broad level of like, do you want to live in a world that is more open or less open? You know, that's um, yeah. you, sir, have the most instructive relationship, oh, I, I think, in all of I doubt it. Uh, married to a French woman, as people might know. Um, no, uh, I wouldn't describe uh, Emmanuel as yeah. libertarian, but she's a donor. Um, and how long have you guys have been married? Should people Every, do that too? Yeah, yeah, if you go to reason.com slash Matt's wife, cool, cool. Um, you yeah. can uh, donate yep. to our that annual. That URL right. does not work. I want to be clear. <laughs> but how you but have actually, been if, you, if you try. You have been married for uh, like, over there. what, 20 years? <laughs> If you, if you try to How go to that you URL, been married, though, you know what will happen is you have a highly married. functioning, okay. you know. We've been married for 24 what? years. Uh, right. The next year, what, are we still in 2021? So next year will be our, uh, whatever the 25 year anniversary is. It's good to know yeah, how long. The, uh, Boulders or the something. The gold? The gold? Or is it no. paper? Gold to be like 50. Since, no, no, uh, silver is 50, isn't it? Since I never gave her an engagement I ring, I guess it's like, it's time to. Could be the time. She should, should give you one. It should be an equal exchange. That's, a, that's a, a, yeah. an excellent idea. Anyways, we yeah. met in we met in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, where we lived, uh, and uh, not a libertarian, but uh, but you know Wait, you, you lived in Eastern Europe. It's true, that's Central Central Have Europe. you ever talked middle, or written about Middle that? Europa? Really, um, uh, we got so the, the shot Lord of the Rings. We had the uh, you know, commonality on the big question, which is communism sucks, mm. and um, and you know she's French, but and and has French tastes and things like uh, healthcare systems. Uh, but at oh, the same time, you, my my friend, uh, it's more complicated than that. As re readers mm. will uh, know, know, I'll let the search button be your guide. Uh, but uh, she hasn't lived in France as an adult, uh, basically since the age of 21. And there's a reason for that. Um, like she's attracted. She's now an American citizen. She's attracted to the uh, the more free and wide open American uh, life. Like uh, this is common among French expats mm -hmm. here. Like there isn't just one school that you have to go to that sends you in this direction. You can just kind of keep reinventing. She reinvents it as a private investigator midway through her journalistic uh, career. So uh, we have those big things in common. Um, you and, bonded over, among other things, the cure, right? Uh, I mean, she was a uh, and is, uh, but like she was a like a member of the International uh, Cure fan club, like mm. some kind of secretary, and wrote about it. And I like the cure. I've been to a few of the Cure Freak concerts, not as many. But as what I'm getting at is that you're you share a broadly consistent worldview, but it's it would other interests than certainly than politics or ideology. Yeah, it probably had more to do with journalism and uh, and uh, and Central Europe, but also commies are bad and life should be fun and filled with uh, adventure and seeking i think is which is a pretty from. good uh, first approximate order of a uh, libertarian worldview a pre-political worldview right that yeah. life should be fun and open and uh, innovative yes um i think that's all the dating tips that we're gonna have time for that was that today. was a, yeah. a, the rousing ending of a real i mean if we're gonna make each other awkward we should have listeners making us awkward uh, as well um thank you again for getting to the uh, bottom of this Catherine. is there anything they should know or think about right at the end of this uh, uh, yeah, yeah you know one thing that occurs to me yeah. is that we are having a webathon and so people should mm. consider donating to mm -hmm. it matt um is reason, that a tax deductible it is a tax deductible donation and uh your donation uh not only gets you some cool swag but also supports the important work that reason does to make the world safe for free minds and free markets and you mm. can bid on pixelated versions of our faces Nick. Yeah. Go to, uh, if you go to reason.com, you will get a link to the NFT, the round, Reason Roundtable NFT, which is currently being auctioned off by one of our trustees of the nonprofit Reason Foundation, Ted Barnett, who has a long history in tech. 
Uh, it's a wonderful shot of the four of us, the Reason Roundtable crew, in beautiful pixelated 8-bit form. Um, you know, you need to know a little bit about uh, NFTs and about Ethereum in particular. It's not that complicated. It's, out. it's less complicated. It's less complicated than most video games. Uh, you can learn how to already like lose all of the money that you've invested in crypto. Uh, you know, it'll take like one or two hours to blow it all on our, our NFT. It's a unique piece of history. Uh, and Reason is a magazine that likes to make history. So you can also a couple bid of us ships up. in EVE Online yeah. and make a bid. You yeah. can also just give us your crypto directly if you That's want. That's true. Like, yeah, yeah, we yeah. accept many forms. And we take fiat even. We're, no, we we're not particular we're not at this point. You yeah. can send us an envelope of cash, right. honestly, whatever uh, you want. And also make sure to uh, put uh, those little things in comments um, as you're donating. Uh, send us a comment. Uh, what, what do you like? What got you here? Um, suggestions and things like that. I'd mentioned, I guess, offhandedly that People should send limericks. Yeah, we and did. you did. We got yeah. some good ones. You did. I'm just gonna read one from Bob. Uh, uh, Bob from Illinois, also known as uh, on Twitter at at the Purple Pros, mm. P R O S, like like professionals. Uh, on a recent round table, most dreadful, the hosts were each rendered forgetful, like a Smollett assault. The pod screeched to a halt on a Welchian transitional word pretzel. Mm. Bob, that's good. You win. You win the podcast. We you want, don't have to donate. We want you? your money, but we will accept your limericks. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Have a pleasant tomorrow. Right.